Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to uh, this latest webinar. Um, uh, AI is, of course, one of the things that interests us a lot for a variety of reasons. And I've been reading um, the book co-authored by Henry Kissinger on um, the age of AI and our human future. And of course, uh, what they say there really, Henry Kissinger with people like Eric Schmidt from Google and the other co-author is that AI is transforming human society in fundamental and profound ways. And of course, coming online, as we all know, in searching, streaming, medicine, education, and many other fields. And really what they are saying in their thesis for this book is that AI is transforming how we as humans are experiencing reality. But that's a very broad topic. This afternoon, we are coming very uh, specifically into the issue of AI in health products development and the opportunities and challenges that we face. And we're delighted to have a very distinguished and wise and experienced panel who have a lot of experience in the particular area for the topic this afternoon. And you can see them uh, on the screen. We have Professor Dean Ho, who's the Provost Chair Professor and Director of the N1 Institute for Health, uh, and also Head Department of Biomedical Engineering at NUS and the Director for the Institute for Digital Medicine. We have Dr. Danny Sun, who's the CEO of the Consortium for Clinical Research and Innovation Singapore, and also the Executive Director of the Singapore Clinical Research Institute. Uh, we have Professor Daniel Ting, Director of the Cluster AI Program at SingHealth, Head AI and Digital Innovation at uh, SERI, the Singapore Eye Research Institute. And uh, he's a consultant uh, at the Singapore National Eye Center. And Professor Kevin White, who's Professor of the Department of Biochemistry and Pre Precision Medicine at the Yong Lulin School of Medicine, uh, PI at uh, the Cancer Science Institute of Singapore, uh, Program Director of Nucleic Acids Therapeutics at GIS, uh, at ASTAR, and also uh, significantly for us this afternoon, Founder and Chairman of Provexis. And I think he will tell us a bit more about this later on. So without further ado, we're going to jump into a series of presentations from three of our panel first. And we'll be starting with uh, Professor Daniel Ting, followed by uh, Dr. Danny Sun, and then Professor Dean Ho. And then we'll get everyone in for a discussion, as well as to answer questions that uh, participants had submitted at the point of registration. And also, I've encouraged the panelists to have a discussion amongst themselves, so that it's uh, quite an interactive session to deal with the issue at hand. So without further ado, I'd like to pass the floor, as it were, the virtual floor over to Professor Daniel Ting to uh, share his thoughts on the topic. Over to you, Dan. Thanks, John. Thanks for the kind introduction. So I, uh, I'm not going to actually present any slides today, but um, just going to share, uh, you know, with the audience, uh, with uh, what uh, some of the lessons and uh, observations that uh, I have, uh, you know, seen over the past uh, six to seven years, uh, you know, on the, you know, machine learning and deep learning journey. And of course, the title today is AI. And I can't agree more with what John actually has uh, just mentioned just now. I mean, right now we are currently in the fourth industry revolution. And I wouldn't even be surprised that we are currently in the 4.5. When is five coming is always, uh, you know, in the question of my uh, mind. Right. I mean, with uh, all the AI, machine learning, deep learning, you know, like AI is nothing new, right? I mean, AI is actually first described back in 1950s and machine learning term is 1980s and new kids in the block, um, you know, has been described uh, back in 2000, um, 2010. So basically, if you want to talk about deep learning, uh, I think uh, those are the three, uh, you know, the godfathers of deep learning you have to actually be very aware of, you know, Dan LeCun, Jeffrey Hinton, and Joshua Banjo. I think those are the, the, the key uh, piece of, uh, you know, how the deep learning has really, really hit, uh, you know, the world right now, not just within the healthcare space, but also uh, at the same time, the non-healthcare space. So it's really important for the audience to really know, uh, you know, some of the key, uh, you know, the features of these. You don't actually have to be a computer scientists to know because your kids your grandkids your your great grandkids will grow up like you know needing to know all these things you know as they you know moving forward so i think uh going back uh, to the healthcare space over the past six to eight years we have actually seen i would use the word tsunami right tsunami of uh, an explosion of like the r d pieces like publications you name it you have it any jm jama lancet all the high impact 
digital journals, medical journals, and uh, uh, specialty specific journals. You, you, you. I mean, for those who all of you who actually needed to actually you know assess or you know uh, manage all these uh, articles, you know this is like uh, the the essentially is going exponentially uh, you know um, higher and higher over the past few years. So this is the trend that we're actually observing. And if you look at the trend of the deep learning in the healthcare space, what have people done over the past six to eight years? People started with very simple tasks, right? Gushan et al. 2016 in JAMA, very basic classification papers, but that is one of the landmark paper that has been cited more than a thousand times right now, you know? So, I mean, that actually described the use of deep learning uh, to build the, uh, you know, to build the system in detecting diabetic eye problems. So personally, I'm a retina surgeon. So, I mean, this is also one of the few that I'm actually really uh, uh, been very heavily involved in. So basically, you know, our team uh, a year later also did the same thing, but looking at more from the generalizability, right? I mean, when we talk about the AI system, so we talk about classification, segmentation. The second, the key word that we talk about is generalizability. How generalizable is your AI system to the other population that you're actually not used, uh, haven't used the data sets to develop? So this is one of the key pillars, actually, in fact, when you talk about the regulatory, uh, the body, right? Things that we actually do in Singapore, how are we going to use it in US? How are we going to use it in UK, Europe, and YC versa, right? So those are the things that is actually very, very important when we actually look at not just uh, the population, what about the different machines, right? If you use one machine and you know x-ray machine, mammogram machine, CT machine, MRI, retina imaging, cameras, like how do you actually standardize uh, you know, all these, uh, you know, the, the input and the output and as a regulatory body, how do you regulate all these applications of different, you know, the the, the AI products that come to your doorstep is really important. And of course, US FDA actually come up with the rules, SAMD, right? Software as a medical device. This is all the key things that anyone who wants to do AI, machine learning, deep learning, you have to read these Bibles because if you don't do that, you, you, your, 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 your product will just never progress. So this is just one of the two things out of the 10 to 15 different areas that we're looking at in the global trend of AI, machine learning, and deep learning. Of course, when you actually talk about explainability, then this is something that, again, everyone would actually have their hair stand up and say, hey, what is the black box? What is your AI system looking at, right? How do you explain the answers uh, to the patients, to the clinicians? How do you drive adoption rates? So all these are the very, very important uh, topics that people are talking about. And of course, on the R&D space, how do we actually look at standardizing the nomenclatures what do we, what do you, how do you define a validation testing data sets versus a test, um, test data sets? Validation and test to different people means different things. Where is the international body, the consensus groups that actually been uh, created to actually look at how to harmonize all this usage of the terminologies of AI machine learning and deep learning is something also very relevant to the regulatory of uh, the expects. So of course, moving forward, how do we use some of the next generation digital technology, blockchain, metaverse, federated machine learning, the privacy preserving technologies, right? I mean, so those are the things is really, really important. And when you want to cross country, we talk about 5G, 6Gs, telehealth, right? So now we start looking at all the very commonly used term terminologies within the COVID-19 pandemic crisis, right? Right now we are in two and a half years in, and all these words that I've just mentioned for the past 30 seconds, you know, you write the grants, you for sure will put it in, you write into the regulatory body to, uh, to, to apply for expedited approval, you always will use all these terms in. How do we as a regulatory committee or consensus committee to come up with some, some guidelines to govern some of these application, I think is really important. I wouldn't actually hold the mic a bit more, but this is just the general sense that I've observed for the past six to eight years, just to share with the audience. And uh, thanks very much for, for, for the kind sharing. And we'll see you later in the panel discussion. Thanks. Well, thanks very much, Daniel. That was an excellent, and I would say a very passionate uh, overview of the issues at hand. Uh, so it's great to have you kickstart this session by giving us the background and certainly touching on the regulatory concerns, because I think that's a major hurdle that needs to be addressed. And I 
hope that this webinar will provide some answers and clarification on it because there's a significant lack of clarity and standards across jurisdictions at this point in time. So now I'd like to uh, pass the time over to Dr. Danny Sun, um, CEO of Chris, and uh, he has some slides that he'd like to share with us as he talks about more of the drug development aspects uh, in relation to AI. Danny, over to you, please. Thanks, John. Um, hope you all can hear me. So I've just got uh, six or seven slides, which this may be a broad view of where AI is impacted in terms of drug discovery development, as well as in clinical trials, maybe just to frame the conversations we'll have later at the panel. Next slide, please. And so if you're talking about the, the, the very early stages of biology and trying to get a target identification, you know, because uh, a quicker, more robust elucidation of this can actually help us get going with understanding uh, what is druggable or what is uh, relevant to be drugged. And so some technologies that have been applied here, for example, by benevolent AI, which really does a deep literature searches, right? And so uh, it's just an example here, ben benevolent uh, together with AstraZeneca have been working together to target some very tough uh, diseases, chronic kidney disease being one, and uh, benevolent uh, and Astra actually then actually had a project which uh, was promoted, uh, a target is promoted for AZ portfolio for drug discovery effort. And what benevolent AI does as a company is uses uh, data increment interconnectivity disease networks to really discover uh, dysregulated pathways and mechanisms. And then from there, we try to uh, pull out some uh, usable targets. Next slide. Another company uh, in this space, uh, really looking at protein folding. Uh, you may know of this company called AlphaFold, uh, which comes from uh, Google's uh, AI spin-off DeepMind. And AlphaFold has, uh, there's this challenge, the grand challenge of protein folding, right, which is uh, uh, basically the understanding of how you can get to a 3D structure of a protein just on its amino acid sequence, right? And this has been a grand challenge for a long time because with that, uh, you know, from, from genetics, you can actually de de determine uh, amino acid sequences. But from there, how do you get to a three-dimensional protein has been uh, uh, of great intrigue uh, to, to folk in medicine, folk in drug development and so forth. And so they measure practice just last year uh, when AlphaFold uh, looked at the, through its uh, AI ML systems, uh, through uh, several iterations and refinement, uh, they were able to uh, predict a protein structure straight up from an amino acid sequence. And this has been a very powerful development. Uh, and this has actually been a major choke point in drug target discovery uh, for the longest time. Right? And so this has really reduced the time from what could have taken years in some uh, cases so now possibly just a matter of days. Next slide. Uh, another company in silico medicine, uh, which uh, touts uh, its ability to go end to end from a target discovery all the way through to chemistry and then into clinical trials. And this uh, company in silico uh, discovered a novel target in uh, uh, IPF, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, uh, through what it uh, claimed to be AI means. Uh, and then also develop molecule, uh, chemically, chemical mod molecule uh, through, again, an AI uh, algorithm. And so this is a drug that's entered the uh, first in microdosing uh, late last year. Next slide. A uh, small molecule discovery, uh, Evotech, a, a, a European-based biotech in Accenture. Uh, again, this is in chemistry. And this is a collaboration uh, that in April of 2020, uh, 2021, last year, announced a phase one clinical trial for an A2 receptor antagonist for oncology. It was apparently found in eight months using Accenture's central chemist uh, AI design platform. So again, the chemi chemistry space, a very attractive one uh, for drug development and drug discovery companies. Next slide. We're a little bit more downstream. Um, you talk about uh, AI in clinical trials now, and uh, there, there are some areas which uh, they'll uh, uh, AI is actually pretty useful uh, in trial operations, in trial design and recruitment. So, for example, uh, Deloitte, uh, through its Converge Health uh, 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 arm, uh, has been working to try to build systems uh, based on the Amazon Web uh, AWS, uh, uh, protocol builder, CRF builder, SDTM, and uh, tables, listings, and figures types modules, right? And why this is important is because, as those who are involved in clinical trials know, Writing a protocol in an error-free way actually can be quite challenging. And then deriving a CRF from the protocol and then getting your, your data tabulation modules and then your tables, listings, and figures 
uh, when you're writing the reports. All of these are, can be pretty manual tasks uh, and they can be quite error prone. And when you make a protocol amendment at one end, it, it cascades down all the way and uh, quite often, you know, you, you will take uh, many days and weeks in order to make those fixes. And so with this uh, AI systems, they hope to be able to automate many of these uh, processes uh, that allows uh, uh, the software to pull uh, uh, features from the protocol, build them into CRFs, and then build them up uh, downstream uh, into your reports. Uh, and when there is a protocol amendment, those things are automated and they uh, just cascade down you know, uh, uh, much quicker than you would have to do it from a manual basis. So something as mundane as that, however, benefits significantly from the application of AI. Uh, the other thing that uh, Sanofi and Converge Health, they announced this in 2021 uh, uh, also, uh, an adverse events monitoring system, again, based on AI, which again, uh, in the current systems are very uh, manual in nature, it requires a, a pair of eyes uh, from a trained person, uh, whilst an automated system here would uh, give much more consistent uh, uh, outputs and uh, do it much more quickly. Next slide. Last but not least, an interesting one, this company Unlearn AI, uh, which is looking at uh, digital twin, uh, which actually helps to produce a simulated control groups. And so what this does is that uh, it uses longitudinal clinical records collected from a patient, and then uh, uh, use with this, it uses a deep learning based uh, disease progression model that's trained on historical data, and it's trying, it, it will basically determine for you potentially what this patient would look like. Uh, I, uh, uh, when he's on a placebo, right? So the, the progression of his disease uh, uh, on the basis of his own data as well as historical data will allow you to use this patient potentially as a control. Uh, and so that when you come to running clinical trials, uh, rather than uh, using patients as a control, you can have these virtual controls or simulated control groups. And that will help in terms of reducing the size of uh, 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 trial co cohorts and allow you to recruit much faster. Next slide. So overall, over the last sort of six slides, I just wanted to show uh, that the AI is impacting right across uh, the value chain in terms of uh, drug discovery, drug development, clinical trials, you know, from biology to targets, heat finding, lead generation, toxicology, trial design, patient recruitment and pharmacovigilance. And uh, the, the cartoon on the right really is just to see, this is just a small snapshot from 2020. That is a massive amount of funding that's going to this space, a lot of deal making. Uh, you know, many of the farmers are, are lined up with many uh, biotechs in this space and vice versa. Many biotechs are in fact working with many different farmers. And uh, compared to when, when I actually ran a AI in drug development conference, uh, uh, a session rather, uh, about three years ago in 2019, when there's a lot of promise of this, but actually there were very little outcomes. You can see See that in the last year, in 2021, there were so many announcements about drugs that were discovered through this AI approaches uh, entering into first in man, and then the applications downstream trials in pharmacovigilance have all become uh, a little bit more uh, real and accessible. So uh, exciting times for us, and I think that this is a great space to be in. Thank you, John. Thank you very much, uh, Danny. So that's a really great overview and encouraging to hear that things have moved on quite significantly from just three years ago. Uh, so it's very useful, the examples you shared. Uh, a lot of it seems to be really just, in a sense, AI replacing a lot of mechanical uh, and sort of resource-intensive type work, which I suppose is a significant opportunity, but perhaps uh, does not pose as controversial a challenge from a regulatory perspective, if it's really just in terms of that aspect of it. But I think we can come back to this later in the panel discussion and address this, uh, because I think, of course, AI has a lot of other uh, uh, applications as well. And I would now like to ask Dean uh, to come in and share your perspectives, uh, and then we can take it from there. So Dean, uh, over to you, please. Great, thank you so much again uh, for having me here today. I'm just gonna briefly go over some of the technologies that we're working on, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, discuss a perspective in terms of, I think the, the team expertise um, and the community that's necessary in order to bridge the ideation of AI and digital medicine-based platforms with validation, eventually deployment, and hopefully adoption. Um, so when I talk about this team, you know, we develop a lot of tech uh, in, in Wisdom, the Institute for Digital Medicine, as well as N1 and the Department of Biomedical Engineering. Um, but I think our core ethos is that technology alone cannot transform healthcare. 
And so how do we bridge this ideation with adoption? And we, and I think many people in the audience and on the panel know a lot of uh, team members that we have in the community, but I wanted to emphasize um, the first hire, for example, that Wisdom made was, was not an academic. Um, his name is Johan Sapinel, who comes to us from the insurance or payer side um, in, in relation to medtech. And certainly we have uh, engineering and uh, other expertise needed to develop our, our optimization platforms, but we also have a team of behavioral scientists so that we can undergo undertake qualitative research with clinicians with doctors, nurses, pharmacists, discuss with patients, caregivers, in terms of their daily journey and workflow, how do we properly integrate what we do uh, into their workflow so it's actually scalable? Um, somebody who, who I, I don't mention here, who we recently have had with our team, um, is a, a Roche Global Executive, who himself is a clinician, but has worked in trial design, trial implementation for both therapeutics and diagnostics. And we spent four months discussing really where the room was for clinical trial design innovation with AI or to validate AI in areas where we could improve the deployment of personalized medicine with AI. And our, 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 by far our most frequent conversations were not about the technology, but it was about how long it would take for us to optimize a dose for a patient based off of how much data. We use very small amounts of data, but if it takes 30 minutes to optimize a dose and a clinician sees 20 patients a day, it's a non-starter, right? So these discussions help us better determine how we deploy. UC Keppo here is from NUS Business, but he's an operations expert, right? And so we, we've worked with KPMG, with NUS Business, with psychology, behavioral sciences, as well as regulatory innovation and beyond to ensure that we have a clear path to make the lives of our healthcare providers and patients and their caregivers easier. So just a very quick run through uh, of some of our tech. Uh, we're working heavily in digital therapeutics, the use of software as treatment. And with our Curate platform, analogous to our dosing optimization, we are dynamically optimizing the intensity of the gaming in order to individualize profiles for patients uh, who have brain cancer, uh, patients who have chronic illness, seniors, as well as healthy subjects in their 20s to 30s to look at how we can better improve cognitive performance. And I want to stress the team. This is driven by a team of amazing uh, engineers, bioengineers, uh, with behavioral scientists, Vivian and Smithy, Dr. Alex and Marlena, Dr. Bina Rai, who is a, a, special, a, a specialist in um, serious games for digital health, right? As well as Yoan, who helps us KPI what we have to do to make sure what we're doing has a chance for actual deployment. Digital oncology. Right back in the day and more recently, we've had studies where using Curate, we have not only reduced the dose for patients to improve their efficacy, but more recently we have, we've had scenarios where patients who appear to not respond to treatment and where we don't change the drugs, but we just change the dose, they go from what appears to be non-responding to responding, right? Again, drugs that appear not to work but if you modulate the dose only with a small amount of data, we can apparently convert them from non-responding to responding. Our goal with platforms like Curate is not to low dose every cancer patient, right? It's for the purposes of personalized medicine, optimizing medicine, as well as clinical validation and trial design to capture more responders. And we do this with very small amounts of data, but there's something interesting here. In oncology, it's very common to modulate the dose, but in oncology, that is usually in response to toxicity, right? In oncology, it is toxicity-based dose reduction. But we, in this particular case, for these clinical trials we're running, we are doing efficacy-guided dose modulation. That's a different change. It's a change in mindset. And so to do this, it's a lot more than going to clinicians saying, hey, here's some previous data, or here's some retro data, here's a dose recommendation. If you're okay with it, please give it. We're, we're now in a phase where clinicians are not only the user of the technology, but they are 
the chief data acquisition team because we use only a patient's own data to manage only their own care. And that data involves calibrating each patient with variable doses and corresponding efficacy. So the clinicians are not only at the endpoint where they trust and go with a recommendation, they're actually at the very beginning, helping us acquire data in the first place. And to do that, we also deploy behavioral sciences to all of our studies now that are interventional in nature so that we better understand everybody in that workflow. In fact, if you look at our team, we have Dr. Agata Blasiak, on Trung, Dr. Kirtika Kumar, and certainly wonderful clinicians like Ching Yen and Raga. I actually, I wanted to highlight our admin team. Our admin team at the institutes have been phenomenal going above and beyond the call of duty to help kind of ensure the seamless workflow of IRBs, DSRBs, financial offices, data transfer offices, and beyond to make sure we have this, this clear workflow to bring AI to patients. And then the final use case I'm going to show is a lot of our COVID work, right? Again, um, you'll, you'll see a lot of uh, recurring superstars here who, who uh, have spent their time recently and as of even including today working on Omicron, uh, working to optimize drug combinations in a very different approach compared to how things have been traditionally done. And instead of us kind of just saying, this is different, this is how we wanna do it, we have actively engaged with uh, drug developers from industry to help bridge that gap. Um, and and uh, it, it's been exciting times indeed. And so the final things I'll talk about is that, you know, bringing AI into clinic, bringing AI into industry, into workflows in both, you know, we, we, we wanna rethink how we develop drugs in an optimization perspective and to rethink how data is acquired for the purposes of intervention. I think for treatment, uh, a lot of approaches, there's varying amounts of data and type of data that's needed. But for us, um, because we need less data, because our clinical community is essential to acquiring that data, it's for that reason why we incorporate many disciplines uh, demonstrating that tech alone can't transform healthcare. And so when we think about um, opportunities, I think that certainly with innovation and tech development, plenty of opportunity for implementing and validating. There's a lot of challenges, but I think one of the most exciting opportunities in front of us is this concept of empathy between disciplines in innovation, right? And all the different fields that in our case at Wisdom have come together to rethink how we can champion equity, uh, accessibility, and the possibility of changing practice in medicine. And here's just an example of all the disciplines that have been involved from building a digital health arcade to interaction design at our new College of Di Design and Engineering, UX, UI, healthcare economics, ops and analytics, and certainly regulatory, right? We live in an amazing ecosystem here in Singapore where when new ideas emerge, our uh, ability to engage with regulatory stakeholders um, is, is unique because it's a very accessible community. And I think that when we start to see examples of newer tech emerging, bridging all of these disciplines together will be absolutely critical to make sure that we can bring accessible technology to the masses. Um, with that, I wanted to thank everybody uh, for the opportunity to be here today. I look forward to chatting with everybody. Thanks. Thanks so much, Dean. Uh, again, uh, a really excellent presentation. And I find it fascinating, of course, you know, um, in the kind of lay perspective, one says that AI creates more barriers, right, between uh, sort of people and machines, but your interdisciplinary empathy perspective is really uh, fascinating and exciting because it's actually bringing together different disciplines to uh, uh, engage AI to address these very significant issues of research and drug development. So I think that's a wonderful perspective to move into the panel discussion. So I'd like to ask Kevin, uh, although you, you chose not to sort of make a presentation, having heard the, the other three, would you like to sort of uh, come in at this point and perhaps uh, make any comments before we jump into the uh, discussion? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, I guess I'll, I, I'll, I'm not a regulatory expert by any means, um, but I can give you some perspective uh, as someone who's spent a fair amount of time in industry uh, building um, products that uh, use AI uh, as an underlying tool. And um, 
I think I'll probably echo a, a few of the things uh, that uh, the the speakers so far has said have said. Um, but maybe I'll say a few words about three different areas. One is um, you know the types of uh, applications broadly uh, where AI and regulatory uh, connect. Um, the the main hurdles that that I've seen, I've experienced, <laughs> and um, I think we've we've heard. Uh, already a bit uh, today, and and then what are some of the attributes of, of successful AI applications through re the regulatory um, framework, and that that th 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 does exist at least in some some uh, jurisdictions. So, um, on, on the application front, uh, I think uh, from a regular regulatory standpoint. Uh, AI is and likely will continue to be mostly focused on diagnostics and medical devices. And although, as Danny was showing all these great examples of R&D uh, phase of drug development, and it's being used extensively uh, and more and more in that area, regulatory agencies are, are much more concerned with the end product uh, than, than how you got there. Um, although also, as Danny touched on, uh, when clinical trials are using AI-driven designs, this becomes of interest to regulatory uh, agencies because we have to understand uh, how, the, how the clinical trials um, were, were done. And there has to be a common ground upon which you're standing with the regulatory reviewers um, uh, in interpreting the data from those trials. And so when AI has been used uh, in clinical trials, uh, I think it's most used effectively when there's early and frequent engagement with the regulatory authorities. Um, AI approaches and tools, uh, you know, that ha have already been approved by FDA. Last year, the company that I was previously president and chief science officer of Tempest Lab uh, received FDA breakthrough status in an AI-driven uh, ECG analysis platform developed with Geisinger. Uh, that helps clinicians identify atrial fibrillation on the cancer front. FDA uh, has authorized tumor uh, mutational burn analysis that was heavily leaned upon by AI approaches for prescription of Pembro. Um, and these are just a couple of examples, but we, we see these, um, we see AI now in the diagnostics and medical devices um, uh, front quite commonly uh, making its way all the way to the finish line. Uh, uh, I think Dan hit on what I think are the two key hurdles for AI and regulation. Um, and that is A, uh, showing that AI applications are re reproducible under varying conditions, what he called generalizability. Um, and B, uh, being able to explain uh, what's actually being measured and what factors drive the, the algorithmic prediction is important. Uh, regulators don't like black boxes. And so what Dan called explainability, and I can't agree more, those are the two big ones. Um, and then when I think about what's what's been successful and what's likely to continue to be successful in the near term, I think about um, AI methods that are used as preventative tools. Um, the tools that augment traditional diagnostic measures with minimal risk to patients. Um, I think those are easier to, to digest. Um, the tools that fit uh, fill an un unmet need, and also, um, you know, the I guess the fourth uh, area would be tools that are applied to late stage disease where other options uh, aren't working well or have been exhausted. And I think some of the examples that you, you heard about um, today do fit in in those categories. I think it's harder to to get. It will be harder to get things through regulatory authorities um, that. Um, that are, are uh, potentially um, key in making uh, decisions for patients where there's already uh, a decision tree that's well established. Um, and, and so I think, you know, minimal risk, uh, preventative tools, uh, filling unmet needs and late stage disease where other uh, options have been exhausted are kind of at least four of the the uh, areas that I think AI is going to have a lot of impact in um, <clears throat> clinically uh, moving forward because those are areas that are um, a bit easier, um, if anything is easy, <laughs> uh, on the regulatory front. So uh, I'll stop there. Those are my thoughts.
Yeah, thanks very much, Kevin. Uh, in fact, those those examples you cited as where there's probably likely to be a lower barrier preventive uh, tools and met needs late stage disease, they really represent the sort of general areas where regulators are more willing anyway to look at innovative approaches or uh, practice regulatory agility. And even in the course of the pandemic, it's it's those sorts of situations, not specific to AI, where regulators have been more open. But as we go into the uh, discussion with all of us, um, perhaps we, we can try and maybe find some ways to propose where we could go beyond just the sort of lower risk uh, areas, because I think to really uh, optimize the use of AI in the areas you've been talking about this afternoon would be to actually push the boundaries in terms of where we can get regulatory approvals for things beyond what is sort of um, lower bar sort of issues at this point in time. But I'd like to pose to you first, there were some questions that came in earlier at the point of registration, quite basic ones, which I think we do need to address for the sake of the audience. And there's some in the chat, which I'll come to later. But there's a very fundamental question, which perhaps I'll pose to Daniel first. Is there an accepted definition of AI in this field? And is there potential for miscommunication because we have different understandings of what AI is? So we've been bandying the term uh, very easily this afternoon, but what exactly is AI? Can you define it for us? Well, I, I think this uh, this is a very good question. I mean, this is a question that I always like to discuss over a wine and cheese session because this can go on and on and on for the whole night and then you'll get up from a bar with no consensus. So, I mean, the AI, as I, um, as I shared before, it was actually first described back in 1950s, right? So Alan Turing and things, computing, and all these things is actually how AI has really sparked off a lot of interest and like breakthroughs for, uh, for us to actually march into the fourth industrial revolution, right? Computing and then uh, AI, that's the third and the fourth. So, I mean, machine learning itself, I mean, if you go uh, based on the definition of what machine learning can do versus deep learning. So machine learning itself, the Arthur Samuel was the one who coined the machine learning term. It says that the computer should have the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. So meaning that if you actually uh, don't teach the computer anything, the computer should actually be able to actually perform its own task. So this is what machine learning is. So of course, that time, why machine learning couldn't really fly is because of the lack of the supercomputers, which is what we are calling the GPUs right now these days, graphic processing units. So with the, in fact, if you look at the Yan LeCun's work back in, or even Jeffrey Hinton, right, in the late 80s, he's really described the concept of deep learning back then. But it's just that with the lack of the supercomputer then, the, the, the idea couldn't really be backed up with the hardware. So then comes the early, uh, you know, the late 20, uh, 2000 to early to, uh, 2010. So that is where the deep learning the GPUs, NVIDIA, you know, those are AMD, those chips companies, when they actually manage to actually push the hardware. So sometimes it's also a bit like this, right? The concepts has to always be backed up with the hardware and you cannot actually live without, you know, each other. So if you go back to the definition of machine learning and deep learning and how in a very layman term, in a very practical terms, when we actually build an AI technology, if you use the machine learning, the the if you use a machine learning techniques, basically, if you have an image, you literally have to annotate where the lesion is in the image before you feed into your machine learning. And that's what we call feature-based learning. For deep learning, you can actually feed the whole entire image into the CNN and just tell the, um, the, the, the CNN that this is with the disease or without the disease. And then the CNN itself, based on what, uh, the fundamental techniques, of course, there's a different types of CNN we can talk about. They will actually go through from the macro features to the micro features and say if your CNN has 20 different layers, each of the layer will go through each part of the image to actually abstract, do a high level abstraction of the individual features. So, of course, when we want to talk about the pre-train and all the different uh, more technical stuff, Usually, we call uh, the audience will actually be, uh, be uh, coming across this term called pre train and image net classification. So, basically, a lot of the deep learning related uh, the, uh, the projects they actually leverage on the pre trained network, which is uh, what the, the, well, the AI um, the network actually use 
to actually, uh, well, they were actually trained based on the cars, the elephants, and you know, the cats and things before you actually use it in your, your, in your system. So AI, I mean, going back to the question, is AI very loosely used? Yes, because a lot of the people actually are using AI for different meaning. So, I mean, when we actually look at the past 10 years, what has really been uh, making the breakthroughs and things is really the deep learning. And of course, uh, Danny actually spoke about the alpha four is also another type of the deep learning we're talking about that actually uses a deep reinforcement learning. So basically all these things actually, when you actually leverage, you need the need of uh, leveraging on the CNN to me is more on the deep learning front. But if you actually look at the data genomics, if you do multi-model, it's more machine learning that you can actually take into account what deep learning does, but you input what the deep learning output into your machine learning model. So, I mean, there's a quite a complicated design when you actually look at the, uh, you know, the depending what model you're looking at. Yeah. So I'm not trying to actually complicate, you know, the, 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 the questions, but this is some of the things that um, actually is quite uh, close to my heart that I actually just wanted to actually uh, take this opportunity to share. Thanks. Thanks very much, Daniel. Um, Dean, Kevin, Danny, anything to add to that in terms of enhancing our understanding of what we're talking about when we use the term AI? Um, I'm just going to add that I think that uh, certainly when AI, AI as intended, and Dan's absolutely right with the definitions, I think when the vision of AI was charted out, I think it set off this, you know, amazing effort across many different groups, many different disciplines to bring us closer to achieve the ability for uh, of, of novel algorithms that have made many aspects or given the potential for many aspects, not only in healthcare to approve with data. Um, I, I think that moving forward, uh, what we can learn, for, what AI can identify for us uh, that we didn't know without AI, uh, I, I think is critical, right? I, I think for some of the work that we do, um, we have sort of evolved the use of AI out of our workflow. Because um, the number one question we get is, where's the AI? And the simple answer is, we don't need it anymore. Uh, but it, we did that because through all of our discussions with those in our workflow, especially the clinicians and our very first clinical trial was actually with the nursing team. Uh, when we were doing dosing for, uh, for transplant patients, uh, we realized we needed something a lot simpler. But the relationship that existed between how to optimize dose and drug and how to optimize efficacy really was learned via neural networks. But continued experiments showed us that we needed way less experiments than we thought, but we would have never known without AI. So moving forward, I think AI is certainly, as we traditionally know it, will continue to develop. But relationships that exist in biology, for example, that we would have never really known without the AI, and it's okay, even if we don't need the AI anymore as, the, as a path towards actual deployment, it can be AI based, right? And I think a lot of emerging technologies went through the same metamorphosis. When, when micro technology first emerged, people saw these amazing gears that were turning that you could make a thousand watches at the same time through lithography. But these devices weren't really functional for very long. And it was actually packaging. It was actually packaging that eventually made micro possible, right? These unexpected industries and technologies that were learned and emerged from the original tech that actually enabled the tech in the first place to be deployed at scale. And so I think that's what's exciting about the field. It's what we know uh, of AI traditionally will continue to develop, but these unexpected findings powered by AI will in many cases, I think, transform industries. Thanks. Kevin or Danny, anything more? I, I, I may be gonna say something um, <clears throat> that uh, that's a different version of what Dean just said, um, but I think from a, uh, physician's perspective, the average physician or the average regulator or all regulators, perhaps, um, there's a phrase that may describe um, how they look at AI uh, that's, that's a, a well-trodden phrase. It's called, uh, uh, there are three kinds of lies, lies, damn lies, and statistics. <laughs> and, uh, and AI is, um, its foundation is in statistics. And I, I, I think that um, what's crucial uh, when bringing a product uh, to market to the physicians and to the regulators is that we're able to communicate in plain language 
uh, what it is that that product is and does. And the AI is, it, it, you know, may have been a path to get there. Um, but it, it, if it's a black box, it's not going to be welcomed. Yeah. Yes. yes. Uh, so I was going to echo uh, Kevin's point, actually. So, uh, you know, just speaking to the, to the question again, perhaps, um, you know, this potential for miscommunication, but, you know, I guess the lexicon will, will evolve, right? Because right now, if you sort of break it down into things like deep learning, machine learning, they're, they're meaningful to the practitioners of the field. So people like Daniel, who knows this stuff, you know, it's, it, it's a way of just immediately landing on, a, on, on where to discuss and where, where you're going to dive into in terms of uh, the, the compensation. Whereas for, I guess, for non-practitioners, it's all this catch-all term, there's AI. And as Kevin was saying, it's, you know, as far as drug discovery development and the, the activities related thereof, uh, the, the question really is, is it a black box or is it not, right? So it is, it, it, take, for example, if you talk about, uh, say, even clinical trials, you know, two years ago, if you spoke to the, the man on the street uh, about clinical trials, you wouldn't know what a phase one, phase two was of, you know, adverse event monitoring, right? That's changed quite a bit thanks to COVID, right? Because, uh, you know, pretty much all my chat groups now talk about that kind of stuff. But uh, uh, so I think for, for AI, you know, you get that progression also at some point when the, the, the general public will have a little bit more understanding about the differentiations and nuances thereof. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, you know, the, the thing that matters for us really is more around, I guess, whether it, it crosses the regulatory Rubicon or not, what you're trying to do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, excellent points. Um, and, and certainly as a former regulator myself, and now, you know, at the Center of Regulatory Excellence, I, I think this issue of definitions <clears throat> and clarity is really critical. So on the one hand, we have all the excitement of innovation, you know, that Dean and Daniel have been talking about, and there's so much potential there. Um, but we find on the regulatory side, exactly as Kevin and Danny have said, uh, there is the need for clarity. Otherwise, it does remain an unknown, a black box. And regulators cannot regulate in uh, a situation of high uncertainty. And I think the great challenge uh, facing us at this point in time and speaking to the topic this afternoon is how do we, as things continue to develop, as Dean was talking about, can we continue to have greater definitions and engage the regulatory community globally so that there is a common understanding? Uh, because if things just move ahead very quickly on the innovation research side, and then after the fact, you sort of bring the stuff to regulators, it's going to be extremely tough. It will just remain exactly as Kevin said. It will be in those three sort of low risk areas where uh, there will be uh, openness to engaging uh, the results of uh, research from AI. So I think this is a key challenge, and I think it's something that's worth our while to uh, not just talk about this afternoon, but actually to follow on through. Can I come to another set of questions now? Um, there is a question in the chat, and I think it does speak a lot to what Dean was talking about earlier, but there, there's a kind of question which one of my colleagues posed first, and it goes like this. As AI uses a self-learning algorithm, and we have little control over decision-making, how do medical decisions by AI affect the accountability of healthcare practitioners? And in, in the chat, um, the question really goes into the issue of ethics. It says, thank you for sharing your thoughts on the development of AI within the healthcare sector. Uh, so far, much of the discussion has been on the development of new technologies, data architecture, but how should organizations and regulatory bodies approach the issue of AI ethics? And as an AI practitioner, how should one be mindful of the ethical use of AI, especially in the healthcare sector. So the issues of trust, accountability, and ethics, can I pose it to the panel uh, for whoever would like to respond to this first? Um, I'll, I'll just briefly chime in. Yeah, Kevin, Kevin raised a good point about black boxes first. I'll, I'll talk about, uh, especially when we get into making medical decisions. And, you know, I, I learned firsthand, uh, a, a black box based approach, uh, will we'll definitely get you a journal paper, right? You'll definitely get published off of it. And then you'll, and, but then you can, I, I've seen firsthand how freaked out pharma gets when you mentioned black box, right? I think there's a, certainly a gap between, you know, engineering innovation, developing new strategies. And then when you're speaking to a community that is there to ensure that their novel therapy has a chance to, uh, move across this kind of regulatory journey, uh, 
you know, cool terms that get journal papers uh, can actually be be fairly challenging to embrace when when there's a clear need uh, to be able to bridge that gap in terms of how to with clarity explain how these decisions are being arrived at. So yeah, that was a really great point that was brought up. Now, in in the context of making medical decisions, right? Uh, so something that uh, we also learned quickly is that uh, our 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 implementation workflow um, is is very active between the engineering team and the clinical team, right? At the end of the day, uh, the clinician not only has final say in how we dose, but they have knowledge on how that answer was derived, right? So we don't do any sort of auto dosing and just let the clinician know. And uh, th they have the final say. And, and more importantly, as I mentioned a little bit during my brief presentation, the clinicians are there to acquire the data in the first place in a very specific manner, right? It's a calibrated manner, which means we don't collect 10,000 patients worth of fixed dosing data uh, yes, certainly acquired by clinician, but we don't we don't do it that way, right? We don't plug it into an algorithm to predict um, what the next dose is going to be. Um, in this particular case, um, the clinicians are there to implement uh, an approved variable dosing protocol uh, that then, with the corresponding response to that variable dosing, allows us to come up with this patient specific. Uh, Plat, uh, profile on how we do the dosing. And it was great, again, that, that Kevin mentioned this good point about black boxes. We have to really delve into it so the clinician knows what they're looking at and is fully informed in how they do their dosing. Um, wh when we think about ethics, I think, I, I think certainly because the clinician is informed in how they're doing their dosing, th there's another element in terms of bias too, right? That can be brought up. But because we're using only a patient's own data uh, to manage only their own care. And it's not large aggregate of data from 10,000 people to train or to treat the next person that walks in the room. What we're hoping is that this platform simultaneously addresses these points and facilitates the, the clear communication and definition that was alluded to by Danny and Kevin to help also with the regulatory aspects as well, right? That it's all open, that it's very clear why the data was needed, how it was used, and who had the final say and how to, to implement at the point of care. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, rest of the panelists? i probably just chime in here. Yeah, I can't agree more with what Dean just said, right? I mean, the black box and explainability, I think that's actually quite, 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 quite an important, uh, important issues to actually tackle. And I mean, this is also, again, a, a big topic, a, a very important questions that always constantly get asked. Responsible use of AI, AI trust, how, how do we do that? I mean, if we actually look at, um, if we can break it down, right? I mean, to three big areas. One is the data acquisition. How do you actually um, make sure that, that, I also saw there's a, another question from the chat. How do you ensure that your data anonymization the identifications, right, right? Satisfy what your country specific requirement is. I think that's one, 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 one um, expect that different countries will have different regulations on that. So long as the patient's privacy has been preserved, um, that's actually, uh, to me, is okay. But then again, then when people talk about, is retinal imaging a form of identity, right? So you start going into such a very challenging, uh, you know, the question, CT uh, face, CT brain, do you have to have a deface, uh, you know, the technology to help you to de-identify the patient? Do you need a homomorphic encryption? So we talk about the technical uh, stuff to actually um, mitigate some of these uh, data privacy uh, related issues. If I don't have in enough data, right? So now we're going to the technical part. So one part is the data acquisition. Then in between, between the uh, data and the technical methodology, then do you actually need to harness the platform of say federated machine learning. So if I don't have enough data, I need to actually collaborate with my friends in US, in UK, in China to do it. How do everyone you know, contribute data into this common platform without your data needing to be shared across the different countries? And how do I then assess the contribution of each of the, uh, the sites you know, uh, based on the final 
uh, the, the, the AI models that has been built. This is something that is currently, uh, is, this is a very hot topic that's been discussed within the machine learning and the uh, 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 machine uh, learning community, right? So that's, that's the number two, uh, you know, um, the point that I wanted to talk about. The third thing, which is a regulatory standpoint. So is my AI, is a fully autonomous ones? Is it a semi-autonomous? Or is it a clinical decision support, right? So if you look at US FDA, CMARC, and things like that, usually this is how we actually break the three big, uh, you know, the, the, the categories. Of course, when you, it is no different from how we actually evaluate the risk of the med tech, um, uh, medical technology. How risky is your product, right? So if you're fully autonomous, meaning that the, who is responsible when something goes wrong, that will be the AI system. When it's a semi-autonomous, uh, you know, the AI, when the final decision is still going to be made by the human, who's going to be responsible, that will be the human. For CDS, same thing, right? That is a, AI is just an assistive tool for clinical decision support. Ultimately, it's going to be human fronting it. So it really depends on which type of AI products you're talking about and then who will be actually responsible, um, you know, um, as a consequence of it. Yeah, so th th those are the three main points that I just wanted to highlight. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. Kevin or Danny? I guess, um, you know, I'll, I'll say that, uh, so, so over a period of five or six years, I was involved in a team that built um, a, an AI-driven system um, that is currently uh, helping doctors make decisions on ten th tens of thousands of, of patients, um, cancer patients every year. Um, we had hundreds of people working on that and we spent hundreds of millions of dollars to build it. Um, and, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's the doctor, uh, it's the physician uh, who is making the decision based on that, that support system. I, I hear what Dan is saying about, you know, purely autonomous systems. And I understand that the question um, pertains largely to purely autonomous systems, but I really think that for the foreseeable future, most of what will be produced uh, that's clinical grade uh, is going to be uh, systems like the one we built that are, and the one that Dean has built, uh, that are interactions between the physician and the AI-based tools and the patient, because at the end of the day, the, the, the physician is there treating that patient at the moment in time. And um, it, it, in my mind, it's similar to these discussions about fully automated, uh, the ethics of fully automated warfare. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we, we probably just don't want to go there anytime soon. <laughs> I just wanted to tap on what uh, Kevin had just said, uh, and uh, Dean. I think like the AI, if you look at the, the 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 use, right? So I mean, the world is actually not every part of the world is as privileged as the developed countries. How do we democratize AI? Is another actually a, a keyword. How do we actually use AI to help countries with shortage of expertise? Is something that in the clinical world we constantly are talking about. How do I use something that has been built in Singapore to actually be used in Africa when they have 1 million population, only have three general practitioners to look after their health? How do we use all these, like, you know, the cool words that tons of JAMA papers, you look at all the groups, it's all from the developed countries. How do we actually use this so-called so sexy technology but actually for the benefit of the large population that really truly needs it is I feel that's where the autonomous system can come in, of course. But when you actually want to deploy the autonomous system, you have to make sure that it's actually been fit into the local ecosystem that they are prepared to actually take on the, the end results, which, is, which means that if I want to screen, you better make sure that you have enough expertise to treat. If you don't have the enough expertise to treat, whether is it ethical to screen, this is also another big ethical question that people are debating about, right? So I just wanted to tell on Kevin's point, one is a very super specialist AI clinical decision support, and one is for more non-clinician and non-specialist practitioners for them to actually uh, use it as a first 
screening or you know screening type of uh, AI algorithm. So I think I just wanted to actually uh, just add that point. Thanks. Danny, anything further to add to this? Sure. I mean, just very quickly, the, I mean, Kevin and uh, Daniel covered it very well in terms of, uh, you know, sort of where does the responsibility lie? Where does the buck stop, right, when it comes to this? And, and I think this fully autonomous system that, that at this point still gives uh, many people a lot of discomfort, I would imagine. But I guess the question will come is if the systems themselves become, begin to outperform the humans, which is, I think in some, in some instances is really getting there. So, you know, are, are the humans sort of fit complete in that kind of situation, uh, even for a very tidy trained specialist? So in that circumstance, uh, is it appropriate to still use that paradigm? I guess the other uh, aspect of it is, uh, I, I see the question that was posted in the chat dealing with ethics of uh, AI. I, you know, I think in some way it's a bit similar to the questions that have been asked uh, by uh, for for genetics or precision medicine is whether or not the use of this becomes uh, discriminatory, right? So in a way that uh, you are getting some features uh, with regards to a patient's uh, a potential uh, phenotype, you know, propensity for disease and so forth, and uh, such things going to be how do you protect uh, individual uh, from from being discriminated on that basis? I think some of the things that have been put in uh, on precision medicine side, which are uh, you know, provide some moratorium on terms like insurance and so forth, so that you're not discriminated. Those things we probably need to start thinking about uh, when we start deploying AI in a broader way. Thanks, Danny. Before we leave this broad area, um, on this issue of trust, uh, there was an article which my colleague surfaced, which raised this question of the patient-doctor relationship and the fact that because AI, I mean, is a black box, I mean, we've been talking about the, the perspective of regulators, but from the perspective of patients, um, there is probably not quite a deep understanding of this. And the question was raised in some situations where if you begin to use AI more in uh, therapeutics, diagnostics, whether that in fact jeopardizes the patient-doctor relationship uh, if it's not managed well. I mean, what are your sort of broad thoughts on this before we move on to some of the other questions? Um, I think depending on the application, um, you know, so what I, what I just mentioned, and, and this is actually through some really interesting discussions we've had with the clinicians, since that's kind of a part of our qualitative research to understand how to better implement what we do clinically. What we're essentially doing is acquiring a little bit more information, a little bit more longitudinal information to understand how each patient responds at things like variable doses. Um, and I think when, at least from some of the discussions that have been had in the context of our technology, when a little bit more info is acquired on each person, and that helps to potentially sharpen in collaboration with the doctor. Uh, and by the way, the patient was very, the patients were also very much involved in the process of their own self-calibration. I think it can potentially enhance that trust that exists uh, as opposed to the use of population-wide data to treat the individual. Um, but I, I, I think that takes time to communicate, right? We talked about communication and improving clarity in the purpose, the mechanism, and ultimately the implementation of a lot of these technologies. But I think if we can just spend a little time and yeah, I mean, there's an economics component to this. There's a time component. If there's, if, if, if it's asking patients to come back for more readouts, I mean, there's, there's a lot going on, right? But in the cases where uh, fairly serious illness, the patients are going to come back anyway. So we're using a little bit more data to maybe better inform care a little bit. I think it actually help. I, I probably can chime in uh, from... Uh, just uh, from a clinician perspective, right? I mean, in, in, in the clinic, when I see um, the eye patients, I, I think generally they are divided. Well, they're, they're like, uh, they're, they're, they're quite a few different categories, but like the two main category is don't tell me anything, just tell me what to do and then I'll come back. That's, that's one, one part, right? The second thing is they want to know every single thing about their, their details and things. I think, so this is one of the, the areas that uh, I think AI would also, again, need to be personalized. Um, the information that you share, of course, you always have to be transparent and honest with the patient, but how much information can the patient take in during the actual consultation itself? 
I think this is something that is worth, uh, you know, uh, thinking. That's one. Second, of course, how do we, uh, you know, breach the trust? I mean, breach as in not the, the B-R-E-A-C-H, but B-R-I-D-G, breach the trust between the patient and physician with the use of AI. I think you, you need to then uh, come from more of the... Uh, um, the, the, the key points of what the AI can offer. For instance, like what Kevin and Dean said, right? It, eventually, if the um, clinicians are the ones who are making the decisions, the AI is just there to double check what your clinical decision-making process is. Sometimes in the busy clinic, I can tell you one clinic, sometimes you're seeing 30 to 40 patients. But if you have this AI assistive tool to tell you and to highlight the abnormal areas from the scan, and, you know, rather than just use, uh, you know, scrolling down and reading the radiology report and whatnot, but sometimes with all these heat maps coming up from the scans actually would make you think twice before you say, oh, it's actually normal. So those are the, 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 the issues that I feel, you, I mean, AI could actually, uh, you know, um, um, provide a few more advantages, uh, you know, the, the points when uh, doing your patient's care. But of course, I mean, um, when you actually communicate with patients, then again, like what Kevin actually mentioned before, how do we make it very layman and un, you know, th to easy to understand? I think this is the key part of how the medicine should be delivered, you know, uh, and interfacing between AI and human uh, interaction. Yeah. Thanks very much, Dan. Uh, so Dean mentioned small data earlier on, which of course is... Uh, fascinating uh, because we keep hearing about big data uh, even when when AI is being used and there's a question that has come up uh, thanking us for addressing the data privacy concerns are there examples where AI proved to be a better tool for drug discovery especially for rare diseases considering limited patients and high cost of drug development can anyone answer this question yeah I think um you know, my last example of uh, Unlearn, uh, where they are trying to use a digital twin, is exactly trying to address that. So if I, I think the regulatory hurdle to, for a sort of a simulated control groups uh, in, a, in a standard phase three trial is still probably some way off, I would imagine, right? Um, until such a technology is really uh, very, very well uh, validated and uh, more generalizable. Uh, I would I would imagine the, its adoption in the in that truth in that setting would be perhaps still challenging, but I think uh, 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 in a discussion that I uh, had uh, on, on in, in a conference, it's potentially that uh, for rare diseases where it's hard to find uh, the, the right numbers of patients, and where you may potentially uh, how do I say uh, may one may not want to put these patients on a uh, Possible and rather, you know, give the opportunity to be on active. That's where uh, such a digital twin solution could play into it. There's some way off from that yet, I would imagine, but I think that's that would be helpful. And I would say a lot of AI uh, drug discovery efforts are, in fact, in the rare diseases. There seems to be a fair amount of interest in these spaces. The very tough to crack, uh, hard to dose type. Uh, and, and so, uh, you know, in terms of finding the targets, uh, in terms of uh, getting the chemistry right. So I think in those case, uh, in those situations, AI, in, in rare diseases, AI do in fact play a fairly important role. Danny, can I put you on the, on the spot? Um, did, you, you mentioned all these, you know, companies that are, are you know, finally getting things into um, trials. Did you come across any approved drug that was uh, discovered with AI? No, not yet. But you know, we're we're some way uh, progressed from from where we were uh, uh, three years ago, even because you know back then it was still fairly notional. There was a lot of work in target discovery, a lot of work in in the chemistry space, but we you know could not I think find any that had entered into man, right? But over the course of the last uh, year, in fact, over you know in twenty twenty one, there was a slew of uh, announcements there. So we'll see how it goes. I was I would imagine they've, they've touted, although I think to get real hard data as to exactly when they started a campaign, uh, when the target ID was completed and how fast they got the chemistry out, you know, those are all internal data to the companies. Uh, I think they've, uh, they've touted it as being uh, much faster. So we'll see how it goes from here. But it's progress. He will be, did they do it cheaper than without? Well, I mean, I, I, I would imagine that. So if number one is that if you if you save a whole lot of uh, uh, wet lab uh, 
work and time that that saves you some cost in this in silico. Although I mean that could be challenged. Huh? But the computer time is also expensive. But the uh, uh, you know if you get a more much more uh, robust readout you know at the beginning and you you don't sort of stumble in your phase two phase three you know that would be cost savings. But as you say uh, you know we, we shall see. Yeah, the other thing that I just wanted to chime in uh, from more from a technical standpoint, as you uh, know by now, I'm actually like to actually come in uh, from more technical standpoint, is that the uh, rare diseases, I think is something that um, is also quite crucial that uh, when we're actually trying to beef up the data, I think I always um, encourage um, my collaborators, I mean, collaboration is key. So get more friends and to build this together. If you don't have enough, see whether there's any room um, and explore to do it together. But of course, when the data privacy rules is, a, is, a, is, a, is an issue, then we have to use some of the things that we mentioned before, federated machine learning to do it. But of course, right now, we also have another part that I haven't actually mentioned before, which is what we call synthetic AI. So basically, uh, how do we uh, generate more data points based on your original data sets to make more data, make more uh, varieties of the data. This is something that is also another uh, very um, interesting uh, areas that, uh, you know, the um, the synthetic AI space is actually looking at. Just, 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 just to uh, chime in there. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Dan. Uh, two questions in the chat, which are linked. Uh, what are the most reliable sources to collect data? How do we ensure the integrity of data feed into AI machines? Can they be altered according to the need of companies? Dean, do you want to have a go at this first? Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I think our our um, our opinion on this is quite specific um, because we we need our data to be uh, acquired very specifically. Actually, if we think beyond just patient specific data, um, when we develop our drug combinations, we often get asked by whether it's companies or colleagues where they say, "I've got millions of data points uh, with different drugs." at different doses and different combinations, different permutations. Can you feed it into your algorithm and give us a bunch of combinations? And so when we, when we look over this data, 99.99% of the time, probably 100% of the time, uh, we can't use that data. And the reason is when, when you have this many drugs at this many doses and all the permutations that can arise from that, that's, it, that's way too many permutations that any pre-existing data will address. And so what we do is we prospectively run experiments that cover the space. And these are very interesting data points. It's very simple design of experiments like principle, right? Where you need drug one, eight, and nine at a specific dose, drug one, two, three, four, five, six at a specific dose. We're not really trying to give a six drug combination, but there's a very minimal set of drug combination permutations you have to run to cover that massive space. And when we get millions of data points, it may literally only cover a very small chunk of that parameter space, but just in repeat, right? And so in reality, that's why, and again, I'm speaking mostly for very specific applications, combo optimization, dynamic dosing of patients, we use small data. For a lot of the diagnostic applications, you need a ton, right? But in our, per, for our case, um, we, 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 the data we need doesn't exist frankly, right? That's why we have to run out the experiments because patients uh, are, are different from themselves over time. That's why we don't use pre-existing data from other patients because drug combinations matter not only by which drugs you put together, but which respective dose you give for each drug, which could go back and then change the composition of that combination. We need all the right data points to be done. And so that being said, um, that, that's why we prospectively collect our data. And now how transferable that is to other models, um, to other systems, it frankly may not be. Uh, because uh, if we're running optimization on making new combos uh, or prioritizing combos or personalizing dosing, uh, chances are if someone else needs uh, data, it, it's probably for a different application, in fact. And in those cases, I want to make clear, we're not advocating against big data. I think that it's just that for specific types of intervention, uh, we, we need to make sure we're getting the right data. So I, I don't think it's necessarily that transferable uh, into other applications. I, I probably um, represent the, the other side of the spectrum on this um, in terms of my experience. Um, because, uh, you know, at Tempest, we were bringing in 
more than a third, I think, of, of the cancer patients in, in, in the U.S. Um, every year. They're clinical data, producing massive amounts of molecular data. And um, I, I think a couple points. One is, um, in order to make that data useful, we literally had uh, a couple hundred, <laughs> sometimes more, uh, uh, clinical uh, uh, data entry people cleaning, screening the data. We had another whole team just building the platform for them to use to make their job easier. And we had another whole team building the automated tools to uh, pull out what we could uh, and clean what we could in an automated way. But you're, you're talking about a massive, massive operation that was required in order to just get the data into a state uh, that it would be useful. Uh, to, to use as population data or so-called big data uh, and then uh, build predictive analytics that then could be tested and validated because then it's only at that point can you test and validate. And um, I think it is important to know because we talked a lot about uh, uh, you know smaller data sets and, 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 and how that might work. Most of, uh, most of the experience of clinicians, is using population data to make decisions because that's how most clinical trials, uh, you know, double-blind clinical trials are, are run. I mean, when 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 we uh, make clinical decisions about COVID vaccines, uh, those were tens of thousands of people before you know any anything was ready to go, and that's true in in most uh, you know in most uh, uh, clinical applications, and so big data um, is only useful. Uh, I think when it's properly cleaned, and then uh, after it's been properly cleaned, you've built your predictors, then you have to go and validate them. And um, these two areas of generalizability and explainability have to be tackled. Thanks very much, uh, Dean and Kevin. Uh, Daniel, just now you spoke about democratization. Um, there's a question on open source algorithms helping towards this. Um, but questioning what's the regulatory expectation on use of such uh, algorithms. Could you comment on this and then others can chime in? Yeah, I think these are very good questions. And more and more we see there's a open source uh, platform for people to build uh, algorithms. And uh, of course, there's a lot of also a pre-trained CNN model that she mentioned before, right? Um, in terms of um, building an AI model that's specific to the intended use environment. So when um, I haven't actually used this word today, I'm actually quite surprised because I mean, of all the AI trust and things, I think the intended use environment, I think these three keywords is very important in the whole US FDA, the guidelines. How do you build your AI models to fit and to satisfy what you want to use in the real world setting is very important. So even though there will be an open source platform for you to build al algorithms and stuff, but the data itself, you still need to use your own data to either build it, validate it, or test it, right? So, I mean, those are the, the, the different parts. When we talk about regulatory requirement, it may, do, in, I mean, that, that actually can be actually um, divided into, again, two parts. One is you yourself wants to build it, the second is you want to use it, uh, you know, the, um, the commercially AI algorithms. So, I mean, if the questions was directed more on the building side, then I think if you want to use your data to build, but you use the off-the-shelf software as a technical methodology, I think at the end of the day, you still have to actually fulfill the regulatory requirement. So, I don't think that would be a hindrance for you to actually use the open source, but you would actually need to showcase that with your own data, it actually hits the clinically acceptable standards. So that's one. Second is for the commercially AI algorithms, if you actually say, hey, I mean, uh, this is uh, use off the shelf and things, like what can we say, right? Um, at the end of the day, I don't really care how you actually make the, the uh, I don't really care how you built it, but so long as you fulfill the validation, your testing, I always use, like to use the analogy. I don't care where you actually train your college basketball. So long as you keep getting like uh, the rings and, you know, the NBA, that's a good basketball player. That's a good team, right? So those are the things that I always tell people that you have to test 
retest, retest, and retest. This is uh, how, and then even if you, after you get the regulatory approval, you still have to get the post-market surveillance and make sure that it still fits, you know, the, 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 satisfy the requirement once the uh, AI algorithms is being deployed. So, I mean, I, I'm not sure whether I've actually answered the, the audience question, but this is how I will actually see these questions, yeah. Thanks. Kevin, uh, have you had experience in this area? Your thoughts on this? Um, yeah, I, 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 you know, I think um, the, the last bit I said pretty much uh, it, it reflects my, uh, my point of view on it. Thanks. Any other inputs on this point? If not, there's one more question in the chat, which is talking about the interoperability of platforms and the fact that clinicians have to keep uh, sort of entering data because the platforms are not interoperable. Uh, what's your experience and what are your observations on this issue? I, I think all the questions is always uh, keep uh, showcasing all my pain points <laughs> when I'm trying to handle. This, this was all my frustrations for the past eight years. Thanks everyone for bringing this up. But I mean, uh, let me just share some of my real points, right? Uh, of course, like when, uh, okay, wearing my head as a cluster AI program for, for, for Sing Health, right? We, we, we have about uh, close to 13, 14 institutions in Sing Health, right? And uh, of course, with the data laid there and the potential market size within Singapore, you will always have this tech company knocking on the door. Amazon, Google, like, you know, NVIDIA and whatnot. You name it, they, 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 they really come true, right? So when we actually asked uh, individually, can, 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 can your platform actually talk to each other? Of course, the short answer is no, because it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a problem where we see is a, a lot of the commercial competitiveness between the, the big tech company, right? Microsoft and, 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 and many others. So how do we actually make them talk? I think it's impossible. But what is the other strategy? So you go from inside out. So first we create, so I mean, th this is at least the Singh Health approach, but uh, I can't speak for NUHS and TTSH. But for Singh Health, we are actually trying to make a more agnostic platform to host the different um, the tech companies' uh, algorithms or the software or like the pre-built stacks and stuff to actually fit our own need. So at the end of the day, if we cannot control what people can do, but what we can do is to actually uh, make our in-house data and digital platforms um, agnostic enough to actually speak to different uh, tech companies. Because to me, I don't think any of the big tech company right now has the best and 100% perfect solution for each of the use cases. So you need to pick and choose. So the one that's really strong in say federated machine learning, use that. The one with the pre-trained segmentation model, use that. that. But how do you then actually reabsorb back into your own ecosystem to build this within your, say for, for, for our case, Sing Health, this is something that I mean, internally, you can actually align and make it interoperable. I mean, that's just uh, some, uh, some of the things I would like to share. Thanks. Does anyone else have anything to add on this point? I'll just say that I agree with Dan that the answer is no. I, I think, there, I, I think there's going to be a handful of uh, companies that build these big platforms that have massive amounts of data underlying them. And, um, and, and, and it's going to, you know, that'll be similar to the, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, Google uh, oligarchy, uh, and um, and that's that's likely how it's going to be. That's how it already is in the healthcare industry with uh, medical records. And I think that all the efforts that you know are happening at the individual um, medical centers, uh, no matter how how big they they get on the government dime, uh, are are going to be pilot uh, scale projects in a sense. And the ones that are successful will get, you know, uh, recoded into uh, these these uh, ultimately handful of uh, tech platforms that everything's gonna run off of, because that's the way big this this the, the tech world works. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. So, in fact, I think there was another question submitted by a participant uh, talking about an agnostic, well curated, Asian centric database helping. So, I presume that's also a big ask as well, right? To even get there, if what we're talking about platforms is already a major issue, whether with across the Singapore healthcare system or across the region. Um, so that 
it's something I think everyone would like to see, but uh, going back to this, uh, the kind of hurdles that one has to face and sharing of data, uh, these are bigger issues, I think, that still need to be addressed, uh, not specific to AI, but even the broader digital health issues. We've actually covered the questions and looking even at the questions submitted earlier, I think most of them have been addressed. There was a sort of one question asking, um, what is the regulatory requirement relating to AI applications in healthcare, which has been largely addressed, uh, but specifically asking, is there any gap between countries, for example, FDA versus the European Medicines Agency? Uh, Kevin, are you able to sort of address this? Because clearly there are differences uh, between the US and Europe, let alone with other parts of the world. Um, well, I, I guess, you know, my experience has been with the F FDA mostly. And honestly, um, the challenge in Europe is um, uh, maybe less the, uh, the regulatory framework uh, of, of getting AI driven applications approved and more the um, data privacy uh, rules around even getting that data and de-identifying it and using it to begin with. Um, so, so I would say that's that's the the the, the first step that needs to happen before um, we, we'd even be able to start making those comparisons. But I, I don't have any experience with uh, the European uh, regulatory body. I think what I'd read was that, um, in fact, in some ways, because the U.S. system, the FDA, is less there's less in definition at this point. In some ways, one could argue it's actually. Uh, better in a way for innovation, whereas Europe has defined it uh, very definitively from the point of view of patient protection and data protection. So that has actually imposed, at least from that article that I read, uh, more restrictions uh, when it comes to the use of AI. Uh, I would say boots on the ground, that's, that's, that's a fair assessment. And I also think that the FDA has uh, thought quite a bit about encouraging innovation in that, this space and has been um, you know, taking actions to help uh, the, the, the um, companies uh, and the, and the um, you know, not-for-profit sector in navigating um, their world uh, to, to actually bring some of these uh, tools that are AI-based uh, to the clinic. Well, thank you very much. It's been a really uh, fascinating and interesting session chatting with all of you today. Um, maybe in rounding up, I could just ask you to give us one takeaway from your perspective. And uh, based on my screen, I'll go to Kevin, Danny, uh, Daniel, and end with Dean. So Kevin, um, what takeaway would you like us to have today? Well, I, I would. I, there were quite a few questions about um, what I would call the autonomous AI future. And I think uh, one takeaway everybody should have is that's very theoretical at this point. And um, in the real world, we're actually dealing with um, how do we use AI as a tool to uh, make the things that we're already doing better, more effective, and make life easier for physicians, um, drug developers, um, and, and everyone in the ecosystem. Uh, and and that, that, will include, that includes the regulators. Um, and so um, I, I just want people to know that uh, this, this, this uh, dream of having fully autonomous decision-making that's better than humans uh, for, for the most part is, is off in the future. And we're gonna get there, but we're gonna get there uh, hopefully deliberately step-by-step step and in a way that everybody's comfortable with. Thank you. Danny? Yeah. I I think the takeaway for me is that uh, we are really, you know, at, at in early days uh, because right now uh, the use of this technology is just pro pro proliferated right across the value chain in terms of the drug discovery, uh, drug development, clinical trials, uh, the value chain. And uh, when, you know, when all this comes together, I think uh, we are looking at a sort of golden age when it comes down to discovering new medicines and uh, doing the trials and actually treating people. So yeah, very exciting space. Thanks. Daniel. Uh, I just wanted to say, don't get put off by all our frustration and challenges and, and all these things. And because I think ultimately, I always share with my wife, I always sleep with excitement. 
I see like there's so many things is happening just as we speak right now. Every day there's different things, metaverse, blockchain, you know, the, there's so many different the AI techniques is coming on board. And of course, like how, uh, as, you know, from the regulatory uh, standpoint, how do we catch up? is always something that, uh, you know, um, I, I think different regulatory bodies around the world is uh, having a big headache for. But for people who actually, uh, you know, uh, immerse in the more R&D part, like, you know, like all the panelists here, I think this is a highly exciting era and I'm always counting my blessing to be actually born in this era, right? Quantum computing is just a, a few steps away and 5G, 6G technology. There's so many different combinations of stuff that we are talking about, uh, you know, in this digital era. So, I mean, uh, just wanted to uh, walk away with a positive, uh, you know, encouragement for the audience to, um, you know, to, to, to join us in this journey. Thanks. Thanks so much, Daniel. And the last word to you, Dean. I'll just add that I think we need more events like this where we, we gather those with a broad range of expertise, uh, clinical, right, with uh, Danny and Daniel and drug development, uh, starting companies, navigating this roadmap, uh, and technology development, deployment, and beyond. I think we need a lot more of these discussions because, first of all, there's, there's opportunity for collaboration in innovation, meaning taking big data strategies like the ones that Kevin has developed to identify actionable regimens for patients, and then taking other AI-based approaches to optimize dosing and combo design for drug development or treating patients, and then how these type, this type of dialogue can better inform the regulatory process, which is right now at a, at a time where we're trying to really define what AI is, what it is for healthcare, uh, you know, how far away are we towards automated care? Do we need to be there anytime soon, all the way to the profound improvements that can be experienced when it's, uh, you know, clinicians being assisted with AI uh, that we talked about as well. So I, I think we need more events like this to uh, build broader collaboration in the AI innovation space. And a lot of it is, is connected um, and, and use this as a foundation to engage more with the regulatory community uh, to advance the field forward as a whole. Thank you. That's excellent. Well, thank you very much to each of you for your time. I mean, just picking up uh, Dean's last point, um, and we've seen this uh, working out in the course of the pandemic as well, engage the regulators early and bring all the other collaborators in early as well. So there is this conversation going on, especially in areas such as this, you know, where AI is still an area that has a lot of excitement, as Daniel said, but people still have a lot of questions. And far better we journey on together, as Kevin said, so it's staged and we get there together. So it is critical. And I'd like to just uh, close by thanking Kevin White, Danny Sun, Daniel Ting, Dean Ho, and of course, the audience for being very active participants. And we do look forward to more engagements like this. So with that, it leaves me to end this session and to thank everyone for your time today and wishing you all the best. Keep safe and well. Thank you very much. <laughs>